Technoculture. Welcome to a new episode of Technoculture. I'm Federica Bressan, and today my guest is John Chowning, composer, researcher, and founding director of Karma, the Center for Computer Research in Music and Acoustics at Stanford University. Welcome to Technoculture, John. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me at Karma today. I would like to begin by asking you about the very center, Karma. Now the name, as well as the center, is a couple of decades old. The name that you chose then, Center for Computer Research in Music and Acoustics, do you think that still reflects what is being done today? Yeah, I think it does. We do work with computers, as you can see. We do a lot of work in acoustics, which can be range from physical acoustics to room reverberation to psychoacoustics. So I think these are it's a broad enough name that characterizes fairly what we do here. So the, uh, the actual work began in 1964 when I was a graduate student. I read the article by Max Matthews in Science Magazine, and uh, I had no experience in electronic music or electronics. I had no experience in computers. I was a musician, trained and lived and loved music. I had come from Paris, studying with Nadia Boulanger in 1959 until 1962. And while there, I had heard music by European composers, Boulez, Stockhausen, Pousser, you know. Berio, and the idea of composing for loudspeakers was very interesting to me, but I had no means and no qualifications. So when I came to Stanford as a graduate student composer, I thought there's no opportunity to do that here. And uh, then I read Max's article, my second year of graduate work. Someone gave it to me, I read it and something snapped in my head, which was, if I can learn to program a computer, I can, in theory, generate anything that my mind can conceive as long as the source is a loudspeaker. Because the only equipment that's required in Max's initial article was a computer, digital analog converter, and loudspeaker. It's exactly what we have in every device. It's still our iPhones, our iPads, and this and that. We have DACs, computers, and loudspeakers, all of which increased in quality and speed. But the idea of this abstract notion that without having to learn how to patch or deal with electronic instruments, I could go directly from musical thought through programming to music making. That was the attraction. So I can just say that in 1964, I began work in spatialization, having been struck by Stockhausen's Kontakta, for example, in four channels, and that was my goal. Then other graduate students became interested in what I was doing and joined in. I finished my degree and began teaching and uh, we had a nice team by 1972. Myself, Lauren Rush, another composer, Andy Moore, a computer scientist, John Gray, a psychoacoustician, or perceptual sciences and psychology. And so in 1974, we formed a Center for Computer Research in Music and Acoustics, KARMA. And you're still active here. What makes you curious today? Oh, well, I still compose slowly, but uh, that's my way of working. I uh, like the time, the unconstrained, uh, well, composing without pressure. I've only had one commission in my life. Others I've turned away. And uh, so I work at making music, and it always involves research, usually in some perceptual domain. And uh, at the moment, we've just submitted a project to the scientists at Chauvet, in the Chauvet Caves in 
southern France, doing a project with them, which is quite compelling and quite unusual. Do you want to talk about it sure, a little bit? Sure, I can bit? tell you. So Chauvet, the caves, the wall paintings are some of the most, you know, 32,000 and greater uh, years old, and some of the most beautiful of all the wall paintings that have been found anywhere on this earth, and some of the oldest. And it turns out that these caves were discovered in 1964, and uh, the French prehistoric scientists and researchers said, we can't let what happened to Lascaux happen to Chauvet. So they closed it to the public. Now, there's been a theory since the late 1980s that some of the wall paintings in other caves, like Lascaux or others, and quite a few in Spain and elsewhere, their position and subject was determined by the acoustic response at a certain point in the cave. In other words, some of the famous images of Chauvet, for example, are the overlaid horses, horses' heads that seem to be in motion. And the question is, what if you clack two rocks together at that point in front of those images? Might you have heard an acoustic response of this echoes like horses' hooves on a plane? What an interesting idea, right? But there's no way really to test that because these caves since uh, the beginning of the end of the Ice Age from 19,000 years ago say, to about 11,000 years ago, the deglaciation has caused stalactites and stalagmites to form and other calcite deposits that have kind of filled the caves now with all these pieces of rock. So you can't really do experiments in the cave because they've been, in a sense, polluted by the natural consequence of deglacialization. So I had this idea a couple of years ago of teaming up with geologists and have them make estimations of the amount of growth of these stalactites it, since 29,000 years ago when the cave was absolutely closed because of a natural rockfall. And using contemporary, you know, image processing, subtracting out all the accretions, and from the image, then we as scientists or engineers and musicians who work with simulation of reverberation, as we did with the Hagia Sophia and uh, others in Chavin, to Huantar in Peru, recreate the acoustics of the world at that time, so that we hear what the creators of these images heard. So I contacted this geologist whom I had found in the literature and asked him if that would be interesting. And uh, he replied, well, maybe. I don't know if it's practical. But then he thought about it, and uh, we just last week received a very positive response for us to come and concretize this this idea in France at the end of March. So, so you're going to yeah, we'll take, take a, a 3D mm, well, image of using the actual th They space? do photogrammetric models of the caves as they are now, and uh, from those they create a visual model, maybe a hemispherical projection. And from that, and the data that they have to make their original models, we can reconstruct the acoustics. That's the plan. Well, there's a big research that has to be done because it's all the refinements of making it happen and happen in a way that's convincing and faithful to the incredibly dedicated conditions that these French scientists at Chauvet maintain the integrity is so great that there's a high standard that has to be met. But it's doable. I mean, the technology's here. We know how to do it. It's just we've never put all these disciplines together to do such a grand project. But remember that these paintings, 
the first year they opened the replica of the underground caves with very careful model of the internal. It's an kind of a museum, but you walk in and you're in the cave with all the paintings. They had 600,000 visitors to this replica. So it's a big thing. The power of these images has to do with every human being on Earth. It's independent in particular cultures. I mean, there were local cultures, of course, the Aura Nation people, but it's something that touches everyone because it's so expressive, you know, this gesture. Okay, so that's one project. That's just one project. This is early 2020 that we are talking now. Do you have timelines, you know, expect to have something to show with these projects or there also no pressure? Well, we we do have a timeline. You know, we can only go into the caves about four weeks a year because the natural CO2 level is sufficiently low that during those weeks they allow people to go with researchers only, to reduce the amount of CO2 from exhalation. So whether we'll get inside the cave at the end of March, we don't know yet. But the plans, if we do, in the next time it's open, in a year from now, we would go in and make these careful acoustic measurements, sign sweeps and impulse responses using the latest technology multi-capsule microphones so that we get the directional information because at any point in the cave, the acoustic response includes echoes that travel through a gallery into another chamber and come back. And so that directional information is really important to try to faithfully reproduce what they heard. I heard of some studies that involved the neurosciences and geologists, but never for a natural space, always for like an, a temple or something yeah, yeah. man built or modified, sure. not a natural cave. Well, we did that for the Hagia Sophia, I mean, a group at team here, and working with an art historian, Bizara Pincheva on the Stanford faculty, but she's uh, Byzantine iconography is part of what her field is, together with Jonathan Abel. But effectively, they measured the acoustics of the Hagia Sophia in which there can no longer be performance since the early 20s when it became a museum. And we transported the acoustics of the Hagia Sophia to concert hall here, and they wired up the group of singers who do period music, music that was composed for the Hagia Sophia and process their voice with a dome of speakers set up in the concert hall, reproduce the musics done for the Hagia Sophia in the Hagia Sophia if you close your eyes. I would like you to give a comment on all the possibilities that are there today, that weren't there decades ago, and on your pioneering years in the light of what followed. Mm -hmm. You mentioned that a big shift happened from offline to real time. So there was, that was good. But there are some consequences that result from having access to real time. And one of the consequences is you don't have to know so much because you just push buttons and turn knobs and you turn things, make th- noises until your ear says, okay, I like that. The value that in the early days of not having real time is we had to know a lot more about what we would expect from trying to make a two-second example, say a er, discovery of FM. Discovery, not invention, because it's a f- gift of nature, FM, and uh, Bessel functions and all that go into it. But to make a small test, two seconds of sound, I would have to wait sometimes 10 minutes. If there were lots of users on the timeshare machine, maybe an hour to do two seconds of music. But all the time I'm thinking and I'm trying to understand what will I hear. So we learned about psychoacoustics, perception, because the cost of computing was so great. We had to inform ourselves to enrich the possible result. So there was a lot of work in perception. Real-time people just work. 
there's no longer the requirement for understanding to the extent that we had to. And uh, it makes real-time music very rich, of course. And there are some people who are not tempted always just to work in real time. But it was an important contribution when, for example, the DX7, the first all-digital synthesizer, became available and it connected up to a small computer and for a couple thousand dollars you could have a pretty powerful little workstation. And uh, Jean-Claude Bisset, who was my close colleague all these years, we both started work in 1964, he at Bell Labs and I here, he started work with Max Matthews. We started working on a book exploring psychoacoustics perception using the DX7. I mean, there's a lot you can do with it. And we had some really exciting examples showing various things like uh, missing fundamentals and how you build attacks and how you put what the programmers of the DX7 would call stuff into the sound, meaning noise at the right point. All these things that the ears tend so much to as details that are important to making a sound live. But what happened was Yamaha then had another product, and so they dropped the X7 as a... They didn't want to promote it, so we had no support then to write the book because they wanted output that would encourage use of their newer machines. That's how they made their money, of course, so it's natural. But anyway, there's no doubt that uh, the DX7 with a computer democratized music. Until then, we had to have many hundreds of thousand dollar systems to be able to do this, and all of a sudden, for a little bit of money, people could do wonderful things. In a time where computers offered little or no support for making sound or music, what drew you to computers instead of, for example, voltage control synthesizers? Mm -hmm. Well, they were just available. I mean, when I started in 1964, Buchla, you could get a machine from him 50 miles away from here, probably for about uh, $10,000 maybe. But I was able to get hold of a million-dollar computer for nothing from the university because it was institutional and I was a graduate student. So that was one thing. We didn't have the option, didn't have the money, we had no support. But there was something more important. I realized quickly on, after my first project was enhancing the idea that Stockhausen had used in contact with the rotary loudspeaker and four microphones, and I generalized that using four loudspeakers so that I could draw any path in a two-dimensional space, complicated lissage patterns and, you know, whatever one chose. And those were stunning examples at that time because it, we had distance cue based upon signal ratios and, and, and Doppler shift. They were very compelling. When I finished that project about 1968, I realized Stockhausen had to have a team of engineers and assistants to be able to do what he did. I did what I did just because I learned how to program and got some engineers to build a four-channel deck. And without any, uh, lots of help from you know scientists and engineers in the artificial intelligence laboratory, I asked questions because I had no background. But basically by myself, without any assistant, I was able to do this and realize that the power of computers and music is that the structure of music and the sound itself became tightly linked. So in a piece like Stria, which I completed in 1977, done with uh, code in a language called SEO, which is no longer used, but it was an Algol-like language, I created the structure that's so tightly linked to the actual sound that uh, it's all one thing. And that was new. I mean, the idea that we could do that, we realized in the early 60s that this was an aspect of computers because of the fact that programming languages represent what 
tens of thousands of people years thought about thought. And uh, so all of that, it's a very special experience. Are you surprised at how software has taken over the entire music production process? And do you marvel at the sheer number of uh, tools that have emerged yeah, yeah. since the 60s? That's amazing, yeah. When I started a piece for solo soprano and computer, I decided I'd make an interactive piece. Okay, I sat down and started to use Max MSP, which I had not used before. But I thought, okay, that I was told that's a good programming platform for interaction. Now, okay, first I'm going to have to build a complicated reverberator because that's what I had to do for my early pieces back when we did software synthesis. And uh, so I looked, and there it was, a beautiful reverberator already done by someone. There was like days of work that I could just grab it, tune it to my own ear, what I wanted, and uh, that was amazing to me. So I wrote it, a little note to this programmer, just told him how meaningful it was to me that in this interim, all this was done. I th said, I'll give you a signed copy of my FM paper, just as a, he didn't even know about FM, or that <laughs> me and FM. I mean, he, he's some guy who picked up the program, learned to use it, and he did this amazing thing, this fully fleshed out four-channel reverberator system. It was amazing. So I realized that this community is one of the things that has resulted from this uh, incredible growth of software synthesis and and uh, people talk to one another and communicate with one another. Late at night, you can be working and talk to somebody in Bulgaria, who knows where, who has the answer to your question. Yes, of course, all the innovation that we have seen since the 60s also means that when you gain something new, you lose something. So the programming languages you were using are no longer in use, and you have to keep learning. So as a composer, have you chased the last things for a while, or have you chosen what works for you and stuck to these things? Because yeah. the chase can can take a lot of time to learn always the new thing, right? So yeah. as a composer, how do you approach this? Well, the programming languages are sufficiently similar that the basic principles carry over. So if you learn C, learning Python or some other, I think that's not an issue any longer. But my own music is driven by some perceptual quirk or something of interest in the perceptual domain. So, for example, right now I'm working on a keyboard piece based upon complementary relationship between tuning and spectrum. So I found this example, it was pointed out to me some years ago, that an example demonstrating perceptual phenomenon and uh, critical band theory, I think that was it. So the example is a Bach chorale that we hear in four states. A Bach chorale done with a synthesizer where the nine harmonics, each of which is controlled by a separate oscillator. And we hear it with this synth sound, Bach chorale, nine harmonics, sounds perfectly dull. Then we hear it again where the example is they stretch the tuning system by 10%. So rather than 2 to the n over 12, it's 2.1 to the n over 12. But the harmonics are maintain their natural structure. And of course, it sounds terrible, sounds out of tune. Then they do the reverse. This is done in 1989, I think. And then they stretch the harmonics by 10%. So the second harmonic is closer to a halt step. Not quite, but then the tuning is the same, the common practice tuning, and you hear the Bach chorale, that again it sounds out of tune and it's insufferably bad. But the surprise is when you stretch them both by 10%, it sounds great, more interesting in a way than the original. So I thought, this isn't amazing. At some point that will break. You can't keep so I'm 
put together a program in Maximus P so I could test, stretch, and find all the combinations, not wanting to do a Baccarat, of course, but using that as the reference and create music based upon this play between the complementary relationship between tuning and spectra. So it's something that's not been exploited. No one's doing it. You are. Yeah, I am. But And I talk about it to everyone. <laughs> when I give talks, I explain, and I have this example that shows how this works and what the, the math is. So maybe there are people doing it too, but I, don't, I haven't heard. But, but it's exciting. So the idea is music based upon something that's just intrinsically interesting, the fact that our auditory system can make sense out of something that cannot be done in nature. You cannot do that with any natural chord or wind instrument. I mean, the physics binds those harmonics to the physical source, and it can't be broken. But with computers, we can do. And it sounds like a Bach chorale that's better than the original straight for the synth perfect form. A last question before I let you go on artificial intelligence. Mm -hmm. What do you think of the power of machines to be musically creative? Mm -hmm. Are you following the last experimentations of Google and Spotify? That's an active field. Do you think it's interesting or not really in, in that sense, artificial intelligence for musical creativity? Well, I think it's interesting, of course. I mean, it, one encode to the idea of encoding creativity is an amazing idea. And I mean, I actually, it, I don't care. I love doing the artistic gesture. So when I look at these wall paintings at Chauvet, we don't know what they were thinking. It was certainly had to do with ritual or because they didn't live in these caves. They went into the caves, made them, then left. They certainly had something to do with belief systems and ritual. And these prehistorians and anthropologists and art historians in France study this, trying to you know, decipher what might have been. But there's one thing we do know that we know a lot about, and that's what we do as artists. At the moment, that creator put the charcoal on the rock. He or she is thinking of some internal aesthetic that has to meet those criteria. That artistic gesture is what we all do when we make music, whether you're writing notes, how I'm going to make the violin sound on the or when I wrote a program like for Stria, which was an algorithmic program, halfway to artificial intelligence, say, but a little bit like that. Writing the program, for me, was the same feeling that this creator of this horse's head had. It's the same thing. You don't care about the belief system at that instant in time. You care what, what it is that he wants to see or I want to see, and what it is do I want to hear. And that artistic gesture connects all of us together in the arts, I think. So artificial intelligence tries to capture some of that, encode it. I did that in Stria, you know, so like a recursive procedure, which started out with about 20 lines of code. By the time I finished the piece, it was about 200 lines of code or more, because Every time I make a gesture, get back information both from the acoustic result and also the programming language itself, then you make a change or an addition, but it's always backward compatible because the sounds that I first made I want to keep. So it was just this big amplification of ideas like a spiral, this interaction between my mind and the computer and the loudspeaker output that inform me, I informed the program by using it in different ways. It came back with me suggesting ideas. Feedback loop. Feedback, that's what I was looking for. But yeah, this kind of outward spiraling feedback loop, which was so enriching. For me, it was such a joy, but I like doing that. I want to write that procedure or that program. So I don't care if they make music with 
I mean, it's a great idea. It's a wonderful research project, and it's a, there's a way to evaluate it, just as we do any kind of music. Most of it's pop music, I think, that their interests are not the same as mine, but nonetheless, like so there's a billion people who are interested in the results, and there's money to be made if Google could create music that people like that they've never heard before. Well, there are a lot of social issues and commercial issues that affect that, of course. But John, I am delighted to have met you and to share this conversation with our listeners. Thank you so much for it taking the time. It's my pleasure, and thank you for being informed about that which we care about.